Good morning from Quimby and Best Lady United Methodist Churches. I'm Pastor True Luck coming to you this morning from Quimby, where the service is always already underway. We'll start off with a little short song like we do so often. We're going to sing There's Something About That Name. We're just going to go through it one time this morning. But I'm going to ask all of you to stand and all of those of you who are watching by Facebook or YouTube at home. Humor me and stand. I won't know if you do or you don't, but humor me and stand. And sing. This is a, a beautiful, beautiful song. There's something about that name. so much. You may be seated. In the Gospel of John, the 10th chapter, the 10th verse, we hear these words from Jesus. I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. But what exactly is life? Life is a journey, isn't it? Life is a journey. So Jesus is saying, I came that you may have a bountiful journey. I don't know about you, but that's, I think that's exciting that he wants us to have a bountiful or blessed journey. But this journey has one of two destinations to it. One, we go to heaven. The other, we go to hell. And we get to choose, we get to choose which one we're going to. Isn't that, isn't that good? Now, our ticket to heaven was paid for by Jesus. That's the best deal going, folks. He paid for that ticket. But if you choose not to take advantage of that, you can always go in the other direction. But you know what your price for the other direction is? It's going to cost you your soul. It's going to cost you your soul. Many believe that the journey of a Christian should be easy. Have you all found it to be easy thus far? They believe it's, and it's supposed to be easy, but the Bible does not say that. If we follow Jesus, we'll have trials and we'll have tribulations, won't we? That's what he did. So why do we expect better things? But I thought about it, and I believe that the measure of a man or the measure of a woman can be determined by how we deal with these obstacles, these trials and things that come our way. How do we deal with them? Do we do it like God would have us to do it? If heaven is our destination, what's our purpose for being here? I say we're supposed to be obedient children. We're supposed to love him and, and love others, what he told us to do. And, of course, Jesus told us before we went back that we're supposed to make disciples for him. So we know the things that we're supposed to be doing while we're here. Uh, as obedient children, the Bible says that we are joint heirs with Jesus. Isn't that amazing? God's creation, but down here, we're anything but, but saints sometime, aren't we? But yet, we can be joint heirs with Jesus because of what he did. But what has to happen in order for you to get an inheritance? Somebody has to die, don't they? Somebody has to die. You can be a joint heir, but you know, until somebody dies, it's not going to pass on to you. So we still have to make the journey. We have to make the journey. Now, Jesus was accused of all kinds of things. He was criticized, eventually arrested, and he was beaten. 
tried and crucified and placed in a borrowed tomb. Are you and I willing to make a journey like that? Are you willing to share in all of that so you can share in that inheritance? The two go together. We're living in a world where our future is less and less certain, aren't we? COVID-19 is still running rampant, that invisible enemy, but that's not the only enemy that we have. We have a worse enemy than that, far worse. Satan is our enemy, is he not? Satan is our enemy. And he does a good job of it. He puts all kind of obstacles in our path. Things to trip us up. His goal is to go away with our very soul, as I mentioned to you earlier. The stakes are high. The stakes are high. Couldn't be higher. Now, liberals, and I'm not meaning it so much in a political way, as, as meaning to, for exactly what the word means. Liberals are getting bolder and more determined to change our way of life. And what I'm talking about here is those people who reject the teachings of the Bible. That's number one. And secondly, who want to rewrite our Constitution so that it interferes with the Bible's teachings and our religious freedoms. Seems to be an agenda in this country right now designed to diminish our Christian values and to blur the lines of morality. I'll say that again. I believe there's an agenda in this country right now designed to diminish our Christian values and to blur the lines of morality. So what do we do? We just stand back and try and stay out the way and let people have their own way and coast right along? I hope not. You know, there's an old saying, most of you probably heard it, that when you get to the end of your rope, you tie a knot in it and hold on. I feel like right now there are a lot of people that find themselves there, they've tied that knot, they're just holding on, but that's a temporary thing, you realize that, don't you? We can only hold on for so long. Then we're gonna slip away. Got to be a better way. This is not a time for us to retreat. It's not a time for us to retreat. We gotta dig in. Got to dig in. Got to take a stand for what's right. Not very popular anymore, is it? We got to take a stand for what's right. Got to hold the line. You say, well, what's right? Where's the line? I say, go to your Bible. You read your Bible. Gloria's pointing at her Bible. Read your Bible. That's where we determine what's right or wrong. We don't go by my opinion or your opinion. What does God's word say? And once we know what's right, then he expects us to hold the line, not give in, not be wishy-washy about it. The tougher things get, the more determined we're going to have to be. I don't see them getting any easier to you. So the more determined we have to be. I took a little journey through the Bible as I was preparing for this message today, and I want to remind you of some of you, those who have made the journey ahead of us, right inspiring. They're waiting for us at the end of this journey I've been talking about. I, for one, looking forward to having some conversations with some of them someday. This journey kind of ended for me in Hebrews 11 and 12, where we're reminded of the hardships, rewards, successes, and failures of many of these men and women of old. Doesn't that describe them? Hardships, rewards, successes, and failures. You know, I found, I found this to be very encouraging and at the same time very challenging as I went back and looked at some of these lives. As we look at these, one word kind of stands out in determining the outcome of their journey, and that's this word faith. The message this morning is not specifically on faith, but it's in everything that I'm talking about. Can't accomplish what I'm suggesting we accomplish without it. The world will also determine the outcome of our journey, but 
We should never underestimate the power of faith. Don't underestimate it. Let's look at a few of these. We can't possibly go through all of them this morning. I'm looking at the 11th chapter of Hebrews. We're just going to highlight a few things here. I would encourage you to go back and read it for yourself. And I'm going to go down through the first part of the 12th chapter. It begins, by the way, in that first verse, this 11th chapter. It says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for, and assurance about what we do not see. The people I'm going to mention this morning knew what that was all about. First one I want to mention is Noah. You know, Noah was probably living a pretty good life, minding his own business, raising his family. Probably well respected in, re in, in the, uh, his community. God showed up and says, I got something for you to do. I want you to build a boat out there in your field. Go build a boat. I'm sure Noah thought, there's no water here. What are people going to say? What are people going to think? You know what Noah did? He built a boat. Can't even imagine how hard his life must have got after that. People can really be rough on you, can't they? It really can. But he did it. He left the calm, easy life to do what God said. All of a sudden, his journey got harder. But what happened when the rain came? Everybody else's journey ended. And Noah and his family had a future. We aren't working just for what takes place here during the journey. We're working for what's going to happen at the end of it. Y'all understand? Amen. What about Abraham? Abraham was living life. He was already a pretty old man by our standards. Thought he was where he was going to be, and God shows up one day and says, I want you to back up everything you got. I'm going to take you to another land somewhere. And Abraham probably scratched his head and said, well, okay, but where are we going? God said, don't worry about that. I'll just lead you. I'll let you know. I can see me coming home. Luke said, Luke, get your stuff all packed up. We're going. Move. Where are you going? I don't know, but we're going. She called Tracy. said, Tracy, your dad is in trouble. <laughs> but think about it that's what happened and Abraham just did what he told him to do and his life certainly wasn't easy but he did it he left the known for the unknown none of us like that do we he left the safe for the unsafe he left the rational for the irrational and just did what God told him to do and there were some other names there when you get to verse 13 it says all these people were still living by faith when they died they did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreign as a strangers on earth. Are you living your life like we are foreign, a stranger here, and our home is somewhere else? 16th verse says they were longing for a better, a better country, a heavenly one. Read that and see what it says. They stayed the course. They stayed the course. We've got to stay the course. We're not here for the, for the temporary. We're on a journey. And we've got to hang on to the end. And then there was Joseph. He was the youngest son of, at that time of his father. As we would say, spoiled rotten. And his brothers resented it. They sold him into slavery. His life changed overnight, didn't it? Went to Egypt, but he made the best of it. Anytime you feel down and discouraged and feel like you're having a hard time, go back and study Joseph. He didn't let anything get him down. He just kept doing the right thing. He kept doing it God's way. Stayed faithful to his God, the God of his father. And he, you know, he, he worried that like, exactly like God wanted to. When the famine came years later, he was number two in the kingdom there. And so when his Family showed up needing food. Guess where Joseph was? He was right there where he could help them. Joseph told his brother, said, what y'all did to me, you intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. He was wise enough to know that he was just living out God's plan. This is part of God's journey for him. You got Moses. Moses lived the life of a prince. 
You remember he was raised by Pharaoh's daughter. But he saw his people being mistreated one day and he stepped in and he killed the guard and had to leave the country running. Thought that life was over. And he was satisfied living on the backside of the mountain, just living the life of a shepherd. God showed up to him one day and says, Moses, I got something for you to do. You're going to go lead my people out of Egypt. Not what Moses wanted to do, was he? He's a little bit like us. I don't say I'm comparing myself to Moses today, but he was, he, I've made my excuses before. He made excuses, didn't he? But when he gave in and did it God's way, you all know how that story worked, that worked out. Chose not to take the easy way to do it God's way. You can go on and on in these. Open. Verse 33 and 34 in the same chapter, it talks about those who shut the mouths of lions and quench the fury of the flames. You remember who he's talking about there? Daniel in the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the, in the uh, fiery furnace. All they had to do to miss all that is just give in, forget about their God, and do it like everybody else was doing. It's easy to fit in if you just could do what everybody else does. It? They refused to do that. They refused to do that. I love what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said to Nebuchadnezzar. He says, we don't have to give in to you, O king. I'm paraphrasing. We don't have to do what you tell us to do. Our God's going to take care of us. Nebuchadnezzar's life was changed when, they, when those young men didn't burn up in the furnace. Just doing it God's way. It goes on and says, some face jeers and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was, the world was not worthy of them. You hear what the scripture says? They went through all of this, but the world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. Verse 39 says, These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something better for us. It's not about what we're going through now. It's about what God has got planned for us out in the future. Jesus paid the price for it. And there's, there's a home waiting for us out there. But we got to get it right during this journey here. The journey that we're on right now, we got to do it God's way. Verse 12 says, that, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, go back through your Bible. I've just mentioned just a handful this morning. The Bible's full of witnesses that we can go back to and study and see what God expects of us. It says, There's a great cloud of witnesses out there. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance. The race marked out for us. Are you running this morning the race that God has marked out for you? Doing the things that he's called you to do? All those that's gone before is waiting on us to show up. And not just the ones in the Bible. We got some family that's already gone ahead that I hope looking for me. Daddy lived a long time after Mama was killed, and I remember him telling me one day, says, your mama's wondering what's keeping me. I hope they're asking that same question. What was keeping Gerald and Lou and his family? Those that have gone before us, those who have worshiped here in a church called Quimby United Methodist Church, the ones that have gone before us, one of the days I'm gonna get bold enough to, to name the ones that's gone here in the 16 years I've been here. Fair with doing that, you might leave somebody out, but I can still see their faces all over this church. I'm going to close with Paul. 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, starting with the 23rd verse. Listen to what Paul said. He says, I have worked much hard. I've been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move, 
I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles. I've been in danger in the city, been in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and I have toiled and have often gone without sleep. Same on those of you that couldn't get up this morning and go to church somewhere. Paul says, I have gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and I've been naked. Besides everything else, I have faced the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. Paul loved what he was doing, that calling to build the church. And he mentions that in here right along with all these other things that is concerned for the churches. Now listen to what he said in Philippians, the third chapter, starting with the 12th verse. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul says, it's not about all those things I've been through. I was faithful during my journey, and if that's where my journey led me, why should I complain? Jesus was crucified. We should never complain. But he says, you know, I'm still pressing on. I've gone through those things, but that's not my end of my journey. My journey is in heaven. And I'm going to keep working, and I'm going to keep pressing on until I get there. You know, if you're listening to this message today, that means you're still in the game. You're still on your journey. You're just coasting along without much care or, or opposition. You probably aren't trying very hard to change anything. You probably aren't trying to deal with all of these things I listed earlier that's going on. If you're trying to take a make a positive difference, then you're going to be experiencing opposition. If you're not experiencing opposition, there's something wrong because there are too many things going on right now that's anti-Bible, anti-church. need to remember today all of those who have gone before us. The price that was paid whether well, it's back in Old Testament days or in our generation. Those who have worked hard and tried to do it God's way and gone on to their reward. Need to remember all of those. And now it's our turn. It's our turn. They're counting on you and on me to carry on the good work for those who are going to come after us. Jesus said to come back, there'll be others following us. And what are we going to leave this world like for them. That thought scares me. That thought scares me. What are we going to leave it like for them? But we hear Jesus say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Where is your journey going to end? Where is your journey going to end? And are we setting the standards high for those coming along with that after us to make sure that their journey ends? So someday we'll be waiting on them and expecting them to show up to join us in this place called heaven. Must press on, folks. We must press on. Think about this. Nothing that's going on out here surprised God. He knows everything. He knew what was going to be happening. And it's happened during our lifetime. He knows we're here. I believe he put us here for just such a time as this. What a great honor that is. That he put us here for just such a time as this. For us to be involved in, in this in such a way that we can stand against these things that we just know are anti-Bible. Just such a time as this, we can make a difference. 
If we couldn't make a difference, God wouldn't have us here. Now, he'd have somebody else here. So let's not take that lightly. Must press on in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to ask Carolyn to come back to the piano. This is going to be our altar time. This altar is open. It's been sanitized. We'll pack practice social distancing. Or you can pray right where you are there in your pew. But be sure and pray as she plays. Seek God's guidance. See what he would have you do next. If you're struggling with something in your life, this is the time to talk to him about it. Y'all be obedient to the Holy Spirit. Carol? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Caroline. For those of you watching or listening by Facebook or YouTube, we encourage you to be in church when you can. If you don't have a church, we would invite you to come out and join us at Quimby, our best state on Sunday morning. We'd love to have you. But the main thing is be in church somewhere. That's what God expects of us. And until next time, remember that Lou and I love you. We miss you when you aren't here, and we're praying for you. Just stay safe.